There we go. So hello, hello. Um, we are doing chapters uh, 19 and 20 today. Um, I do not want breakout rooms. Go away, breakout rooms. Um, okay, and now I'm sharing screen. Screen has been shared. Um, and we are, so we get to talk about um, some of the uh, US experience and we get to talk a bit about um, the Zionist experience, um, the early pioneers and the things that happened there. Um, so let's get ourselves underway, shall we? Unless of course there were questions. I, I, I always wanna stop in case you brought a question to class. Anybody have questions? Rabbi, I have a question. Yes. This, this goes many years back, let's put it that way, but I, I was thinking of it after reading uh, right. Esther this past week. And um, so during the times of Babylonia, when, they, when the Babylonians uh, basically invaded and um, enslaved Jews, then you had the Persians that, that took over the Babylonians. It seems like that there was a, um, a community of Jews that seemed to evolve in that part of the world and that they were not just slaves. Am I correct? Right. Right. No, that's correct. You know, how, what were they just independent, free living people, some, or what, what's your understanding of that? Uh, well, across the ancient Near East, um, you you did have. Um, let me figure this out. Uh, so, um, we think of nations and nation states, but that's a modern um, invention. And so, um, a lot of the ways of political organization hadn't existed yet. So, in the ancient world. You have empires that have control of territory, but it's not so precise as the way, you know, you are now leaving the United States, you are now entering Canada kind of um, borders. And mm -hmm. so you have people who are living in places that are a collection of people who are um, related or otherwise, you know, have ethnic ties to each other within a larger um, uh, community. And it's not, you know, um, there isn't such thing as citizenship. You have, you know, so does that make sense? Yeah. So you have, so when um, Jews were taken from their homeland by the Babylonians, they weren't just enslaved. Right. Um, correct. Um, so what happens is actually the Babylonians take it. So now, now, now I'm understanding what the question is. Um, the Babylonians do deport Jews from where they're living, you know, basically uproot them and bring them with them, but they don't make them slaves They're They just simply are of the opinion that if they take the um, elite from a land, then the land is going to um, take, is going to assimilate to Babylonian ways sooner. Yeah. Um, so what happens is the elite get uprooted and brought to Babylonia and they live there and they're not necessarily slaves, um, but they um, aren't in their home. The, the idea is to acculturate them to Babylonian life. But they couldn't go back home. No, they eventually get the ability to go back home. It's Cyrus the Great who allows them to go back home. Um, and so that, that's how they end up going home. Hmm. That makes sense? Well, I was just thinking that if I was schlepped to another country and I wanted to go back home, I, in a few years, I'd say, see ya, and I'd leave and go back home, right. you know? Right, although, you know, if you had, if they'd left a garrison, like um, when, uh, when the um, Romans take over, um, they won't let any Jews back into um, parts of uh, Jerusalem and the like, and they station a garrison there that prevent that from happening. So one of the problems is, is let's say, you turn around and you're like, I'm, I'm retracing my steps. I'm going to go back. Well, you, when you get there, where are you going to live? If they, if they're like, no, by your dress and your appearance, you're clearly Jewish. I'm not going to let you stay here. Right. Right. So, I mean, um, it, it, could somebody do that? Yeah. And could they escape the authorities? Yeah. Cause the world is not as populated as it is now for one thing. And, um, you know, even the mightiest of empires didn't have the ability to keep track of every single person. 
but um, you know, it, it is. So it, there's also the we also are a lot more independent in the sense of uh, as individuals, our culture um, gives us. I mean, I, I'm talking about Americans now. Our culture uh, suggests that we could uproot ourselves and live as an individual. And that's not something that's in the pre-modern times, it's not something that's common. Usually we're very tied to your community. Okay. So, like, why did they just not go back? Well, because you'd need the whole community to go back and then the empire would notice that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need to get the permission of the emperor, which they did, and then they went back. Okay. Is that making sense? Yep. It's a good Thank question. You. Yeah. Okay. So um, moving back to modern times um, at home in the U.S., unless there's other questions about that or anything else. Well, I have that written question. Ah, okay. Not related to the, this, so we will move on. Okay. Um, it, at home in the U.S., uh, from 1880 to 1920, the Jewish population in the United States leaped from 250,000 to more than 3 million. Uh, we're running at about 6 million right now. So that gives you an idea that, you know, um, that's a pretty huge jump. Um, and most of that growth was a massive wave of uh, Jewish immigration to, uh, from Eastern Europe. So uh, basically the Eastern European Jews decide they're gonna move to the United States now. And a lot of them do. Um, in the 1920s, however, the US began closing America's doors setting limits on the number of immigrants. The immigrants that are coming at this time uh, look different than the, the Jews who had been here already. Um, the German Jews uh, are fairly acculturated to uh, American society at this point. And the European, Eastern European Jews, you know, you've seen the, the character, like, that look like they come from the cast of uh, Fiddler on the Roof, right? Um, mm -hmm. that, that, and so they stand out. Um, and America at that time is um, a majority uh, Protestant, and the majority and and the majority of the population comes from uh, English or German background. You know, so you have a um, a population that um, looks different, has different practices, in and was. Um, not easily assimilated in the in the popular imagination. Us looking backwards, we're like, why was that hard? Um, but uh, because they're all coming from Europe, even so, we're like, why is that hard? And um, but the truth is that the those who get here first from Europe don't want others to, you know, like now that I, now that I got here, this is mine, no one else. You know what I mean? Um, and that's not uncommon <laughs> um, in terms of how, how these things sort of play out. Um, yeah, so when Congress limited immigration in 1924, then at that point, native born Jews outnumbered the foreign born um, because the, the limits on uh, immigration had happened, had come to pass. And so um, you have a population that now finally is more uh, native born than foreign born. But this is the point, so 1924, this is actually where you start seeing um, the American Judaism emerge in a real way. In fact, there's a, a book that's called, that, that's about American Jewish thought since 1934, so 10 years later, but um, that it just simply talks about how American Jews think. Uh, and it becomes its own distinct thing. and and. American Judaism is different than most of the rest of the world in some important ways um, because it's, it has a distinctively American flavor to it, if that makes sense. Even uh, Canadian Judaism is, is more like world Judaism and less like American Judaism, if that makes sense. Um, part of what happens is in American Judaism is, as I said, more, or I didn't say this, uh, American Judaism is more a um, more individualistic in the sense that families get to decide what they do. It has more uh, autonomy to it, a little less traditional. 
um, more um, consumerist, not in the sense of like, uh, consumerist in the sense of um, congregations are sensitive to what the members think and want and strive to provide that to some degree, as opposed to in places like Europe, for example, and also in Israel, um, you have the country that the government pays for the salaries of the clergy, and that creates a more conservative clergy, if that makes sense, because um, they don't have to be responsible, responsive to what the population wants. And so um, a lot of times, when you have reform of um, practice, and this, this isn't just reform Judaism, but in other religions as well. If you, the, the, it's the lay people who usually want something new. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually the, the clergy who tends to be more conservative about it, like let's not implement this change. And so if you have a place, you know, the United States has always had it that the clergy are paid for by um, donations, you know, like uh, my salary comes out of the, you know, dues and um, fees that are collected and also the endowment and um, those kinds of um, sources. And so I need to be responsive to what you think, you know, like I can't, I can't be dictatorial, darn it. Um, not that I want to be actually, I, I, I'm not interested in that. But I need to instead be very aware of what's going to um, what's going to matter to my congregants, and you can frame that negatively as a uh, you know you're just pandering. I am not, but you could frame it negatively if you know, instead of upholding standards, you're just giving in to whatever the congregants want. Uh, I think that's a very negative way of viewing it, but we get accused of that from time to time. If you want to put it positively, we're a lot more, you know, reform and especially American reform are a lot more in touch with what's working for people really right now in their lives and not trying to say, oh, you should be doing it differently. Um, so if um, the traditional, I'll give you an example, a very concrete example. And I think it's, I think it rel it's very relevant to the American experience. For Shavuot, uh, which is coming up, um, in early June, um, what's happening is on the day of Shavuot, what we're going to do is we're going to offer an ice cream social with um, our in-house band, the, the bagels, playing. And we're going to have this giant you know, social event where people come in and get to know each other and have some time and have a good time and enjoy dairy because it's Shavuot and it has a connection to dairy. And um, it should be really fun. And it that's a, a, a really good idea. I mean, like, is, we're going to have um, 100 plus people there, you know, like if, uh, if the last two years are any indication. Um, if I was going to be conservative about it, I'd say, oh no, the way, the proper way, you know, the way with a capital W that you, you observe Shavuot, again, all caps, um, is you're supposed to have a Torah service that has to happen in the morning <coughs> and it must have <coughs> this many aliyot and it must have all of these different sections of the service. <coughs> Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to need to do the one. And if you don't do that, then you haven't properly done it. That would be coming from a very conservative uh, point of view. Um, I can do that but I'm not gonna have a huge number of people there. Does that make sense? I will have people there. You know, like um, there's a good chance many of you on this, um, in this class would be the ones there. Um, it, you know, because that sort of thing, but um, that's not where the majority of the congregants are. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, if you're large enough, you do both, right? You know, because there'll be some who wanna to go to one and some who wanna to go to the other. But instead, what's happening is I'm, I'm very aware that what matters most is, in my opinion, is that we create community in a real way and that the congregant, uh, that we all get to know each other and have these real deep ties and that um, we have robust uh, connection one to another. And that's why I'm, I'm favoring the thing that's going to bring out 100 people. And instead of, you know, say, being, uh, and, and as I said, you can frame that negatively you can frame that positively. Any questions about that? 
Yes. Um, how do the more conservative members of the congregation feel? Um, uh, good question. And um, sometimes they want, you know, like occasionally we have points where those two things come into con in conflict. Most of the time, if we're going to do a service, <coughs> we do the full, you know, like we do a full service. Like our Friday is a full service. Um, when we do the Saturday, it's a full service. Where they weigh in is on things like the bar and bat mitzvahs, they read the full half time. Um, whereas, you know, if we submitted that to popular vote, people probably would take the half time out entirely. Um, so that gives you an idea. So we have places where they, they can still have those you know, things happen. And high holidays, we have our second day, for example. So we do actually that. The place where, it, it, and, and Shavuot, it seems like it, the, that we favor the group that doesn't want to have the whole full formal thing. Uh, the place where it comes into conflict is um, in, Shav in Sukkot, um, because there um, because there isn't a strong enough group or enough people who want the conservative, you know, the, 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 the fuller service kind of thing. And you have a situation where you have um, solo clergy, so it's not like I can delegate this to someone. Um, well, I suppose I could, but um, I wouldn't have somebody on staff I can go de delegate it to. Um, uh, so we don't end up having this big full service. And there's the place where people can sometimes complain. They're like, you know, why do we not have it? And it's like, because I'm tired and because nobody will come. I mean, nobody will come is, is an overstatement. People will come. It just won't be a huge crowd. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So, so we, we, we work through that, you know, like we try to admit, we, we work really hard. We actually spend a lot of conversation, a lot more time on the schedule than you, than you would assume. Um, working out how to offer services that are going to be broadly um, appreciated and, and attended um, to maximize what we can do. In, in, uh, and that's the, <clears throat> and that's uniquely American. Because if we were paid by the government, we'd be like, we're just gonna run the service and you know, staff accordingly. And like, if we were paid by the government, we, um, that sh service would happen no matter what, because we'd have a second clergy because that, and then it wouldn't matter that if anybody came or not. Okay. Yeah, so, um, and so that's the American thing. The fact that we're paid by who comes. <laughs> um, Okay, so we're done with this slide, I can move on. So timeline, in 1920, US population reaches more than 3 million. In 1922, the first public bat mitzvah ceremony was held in the United States. That, and, and for the record, that was, this, this weekend was the 100th anniversary of it. Yeah, and, we, and happily we had a bat mitzvah today, that day too. Uh, but yeah. I saw a lot of people post pictures on Facebook of their bat mitzvahs. Wasn't that so cool? Great. That was so cool. All yeah. my uh, colleagues did that. And it was really seriously fun to see all the pictures. Um, I even went into my picture box to see if I had any pictures. I did an adult band name it's fun because some of them also had. And um, I haven't yet put my hands on the, my adult band name. It's my, my adult mm -hmm. botanist for picture. I never got one on the BMO, which is a real pity. But um but I haven't even found one from like the party or for roughly that era, even, <coughs> you know, um, I would even pick one. I would be perfectly fine with a picture from that year. And I still didn't even found that. I don't know where those pictures went, but <coughs> I'm sorry. I've been talking all day. Okay. 1924 immigration act of 1924. Uh, that's redundant. Limits immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe. Notice that it's specifically to reduce from Eastern and Southern Europe. Um, the folks who wrote it did not want uh, Jews and Italians. Um, the, that was what they were objecting to. Um, or any other, and Catholics actually, not just Italians, but um, any of the Balkans wouldn't be wanted either. Um, and, uh, yeah, and you can assume a racist kind of point of view in that, that this wasn't, um, this wasn't kind. 
1926, National Council on Jewish Education is formed to improve the quality of Jewish education in the United States. Um, what happens is you start having the uh, after school, religious school, it becomes a thing. Uh, it becomes, Rebecca Gretz is the one who starts it. Um, but like, for example, we, we've been talking about Mordecai Kaplan. He, he um, helps build better education uh, training and you start having true formal Jewish schools that teach after school uh, how to decode Hebrew, how to lead a service. <coughs> <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Uh, now I've got to take over my throat. <coughs> oh my goodness. <coughs> I think the problem was I had sunflower seeds right before this. And you know how sometimes the little hole, you know, can get mm -hmm. stuck. I think that's actually what's happening here. Okay. In 1927, Henry Ford apologizes for pre printing anti-Semitic articles in his newspaper. He, he's the publisher, you know, you, you know him for his cars, but he also was the publisher of the Dearborn Independent, which was notoriously anti-Semitic and wrote things, it would publish portions of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a forgery that's like hardcore anti-Semitic and, and has most of the most of the usual um, uh, stereotypes and, and uh, conspiracy theories related to Jews um, go back to that. You know, but that's the core source of a good portion of them. And um, he believed them totally. Uh, the reason why he apologizes is because the Jewish community you know, organizes a boycott and it becomes clear that it's bad for business. But um, he, he was an anti-Semite to my understanding to the end. 1937, reform rabbis formally support the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine in one of their uh, platforms. Uh, previously, the reform movement had been anti-Zionist. So uh, this marks a real shift. So here, the first bat mitzvah, March 18th, 1922. So you can see why we were like, it was this weekend. Um, her father, Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, the professor of the conservative movement's Jewish theological seminary, was committed to advancing the religious equality of women in a real way. Um, although public bat mitzvah ceremonies were not widely connect, conducted until the 1960s, um, Judith Kaplan had set it in motion. So if you, you know, like it, um, it really, even in the 1960s, it wasn't that common. Uh, my mom, whose best friend was Jewish, uh, her, her friend did have a bat mitzvah. So, it, you know, like I, because I, of course, had to go ask her. Um, but um, it still wasn't that widely done. So it's not uncommon uh, for women. Um, it, it gets a lot more common later. But even when you see the, when you watch the role go by, a lot of the ones you have. Um, adult bar about mitzvahs are not just people who converted, but also um, people who grew up in a congregation where women didn't have them, um, was the other piece. Moving up. So what happens in this period is um, the Jewish community does improve its um, uh, financial standing. Um, the economic status of American Jews improved along with that of millions of other Americans during the country's economic boom in the 1920s. So what happens is, is that you have, though the first generation immigrants are, you don't usually move into the middle class, they do at least uh, get established, they you know, um, are able to move out of the tenements. And then what happens is that their children end up taking uh, advantage of the educational and economic opportunities. And so they end up going into things like teaching and law and medicine where they're able to move into the middle class. So um, <clears throat> you do see something where you have that first generation uh, arrives and works in um, things like piecework and, and um, PIECE -E work where, you know, like sewing items or um, you know, the garment uh, industry and um, maybe in sweatshops and living in tenements. 
but their kids go to the you know public school and then you know maybe go to one of the inexpensive state schools or city schools um cuny or suny and they are able to become say a lawyer or a doctor or something um a teacher and then they move to long island right and there's a lot of people who have that in their, head, their family history out there a lot of jews that or yeah, we started in the tenements on the Lower East Side and then we moved to Long Island. You know, um, yeah, the group, you know, then the, you, the, the group that grows up in Long Island, um, then usually um, their kids end up moving out of Long Island, you know. And some of them moved to say Connecticut. <laughs> so, I actually, you know, have a good number of folks in our congregation as as, as congregants who have parents who were in Long Island, you know, grew up in Long Island and had parents who came from that background. Right. Mm. Um, so uh, it's not uncommon for me to drive into Long Island or to also to um, um, where else have I gone to um, that. Anyway, uh, you, it's not uncommon for me to have to drive two hours to their parents' graveside. Um, although, the, okay, Jews also started their own businesses, uh, especially in new and growing industries, emerging industries. If you uh, grow up outside of the uh, establishment, you tend to be more likely to go into emerging industries. The emerging industries then were music, radio, and motion pictures. So, young Jewish composers, George Gershwin. Sorry, that's not capitalized. Oops, Let me get him capitalized here. Uh, so, George Gershwin and Irving Berlin were among the popular songwriters in America. David Sarnoff, pioneer in the radio industry, established the first radio network, National, the National Broadcasting Company, NBC. So there you go. Uh, and in Hollywood, Jews founded most of the major uh, American movie studios, um, as well as uh, you'll see later, I have a walk, uh, a star from the, um, uh, the in front of the um, music, in front of the uh, theater. Um, the Jew, Jews are um, in all aspects of the um, of Hollywood, not just the um, movie studios themselves, but also production and also uh, distribution and theaters as well. Questions? Yep. Okay. Anti-Semitism. So we, you know, like I had my overhead view slide we mentioned uh, Henry Ford here's a uh, stamp with his fake picture on it because you know for a lot of people he's considered um, someone to look up to because he you know creates the assembly line and, and revolutionary not revolutionizes how to get automobiles out into the world um, but he's also you know one of the notorious anti-semites in in, um, in our history Although anti-Semitism was not as strong as, or as dangerous in America as it was in Europe, and that's been consistently true, it really is not. Uh, it did become a more widespread after World War I. Um, so there are periods in American history when it's more prevalent and periods when it's less prevalent. Um, the period after World War I is one that in, in recent, the more re, you know, like in the, in the memory of people who might still be alive um, is the, the strongest anti-Semitism. And it, part of what's going on there is America is changing quickly, becoming more urban, more culturally diverse, more involved in what affairs of the world. Uh, America's starting to emerge as its own power. And what happens is, is that those Americans who were not keeping up with the changes felt their life, uh, way of life was being threatened. So that's why you have this targeting of immigrant, immigrant Jews and Catholics. And they think that they're destroying American society. Um, anti MS, <laughs> anti-Semites imagined that the Jews were secretly trying to bring about a communist revolution in the United States, yet also believed that Jews controlled major capitalist interests. This dual role, this idea that the Jews are, all Jews are communists and all Jews are capitalists and um, they'll get you one way or the other, 
um, is you, you'll recall from our earlier classes comes out of Germany um, and uh, comes out of uh, originally there were, you know, like the first, the capitalist part comes from uh, uh, German Jews being um, able to build wealth and being able to move into the middle class and suddenly becoming numerous and, and uh, obvious, conspicuous as a newly emerging middle class at a time of um, dislocation, you know, of industrialization in Germany. That's the capitalist source. And then the communist source comes out of the um, October Revolution, um, how there were some um, Jews among the Bolsheviks, yeah, in Russia. And so the two have a historical um, root in the sense of um, that's like, um, it's not made up whole cloth, but the, it becomes a problem because um, it, it has this sense of um, a fever dream of, of um, a conspiracy theory. And it still shows up, like now it's, uh, it, it tends to be um, Soros is, is the, the locus of a lot of that. The, you know, the, um, he's this billionaire who's financing all these different problems in the world that and Jews are trying to, you know, it, um, again, it's, it, it's not logical, rational discourse. It's uh, Jews will not replace us kind of stuff. And um, what happens is, is that um, it swamps, uh, it, it, can, it can swamp uh, rational discourse. And um, we can be, as humans, we can be too easily carried away with this stuff. Questions about that? Where, where does that come from? Jews will not replace us. That specific cry, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's definitely a far right cry and it was definitely something that showed up at Charlottesville. Um, yes. Yeah, that, that's where I first heard it. And, um, but I'm not sure what, what caused it. I mean, I know that what it's supposed to mean is this idea that um, Jews were, the idea is that Jews were, um, in promoting um, diversity and inclusion as a way to cause the races to mix and to have uh, to bring down whites. Um, so I think that's the Jews will not replace us. I think that's what it's supposed to mean. Um, and um, that somehow we're in league with the quote unquote inferior races. And this, I say quote unquote because clearly there's no such thing as an inferior race. That's clearly, that's just utter nonsense. But um, there are people who believe that some races are better than other races and try to um, hurt people on this basis, and, um, which is horrific. To, you know. um, and yeah. Uh, what the other thing is that the other aspect of anti-Semitism or stereotyping is there's also sometimes we get to be uh, the model minority, and that um, they, you know they some sometimes these anti-Semitic ideas actually get um, are backhanded compliments um, in the sense of um, the Jews. Um, we're also the ones, you know, most likely to be invited to round out the diversity of a community presentation. Say, you know, I get I get a lot of those invitations, um, and uh, our success in the in America gives us sort of this model of minority status sometimes. So, but any of these kinds of stereotypes are, are limiting and pigeonholing and um, are ultimately negative. So. Um, I'm not in favor of any of them. So if I hear them, I try to, even the, the ones in the Jewish community that we like to, to, where we're like, it sounds like a good thing, you know? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, like the Jewish, the Jewish, the Yiddish cup, you know, the idea of a, a, yeah. a big smart because yeah. you're Jewish. Like, no, don't do that. It's not good. Because for one thing, it's, it's, um, it's not always true. Um, it, and it's so broadly untrue that those who do aren't clever actually, you know, like it's, it, it's rude to them. 
like as if that's the only reason why a person has value really well what was that about rabbi the yiddish what Yiddish kop. A kop is your head, and so it's, uh, it's there's this image in the Jewish community of you know if, uh, that Jews are unusually smart and that we're oh, okay. unusually clever, and we can you know. But that same idea can easily get twisted, and we're unusually smart and clever, and so you got we're, we're also unusually shifty, and you have to watch us. Oh. You know, like, that can totally be used against us. First of all, and second of all, it doesn't happen to actually be true. We have dum dums too, and there's nothing wrong with that. You're like you know what I mean? Like, so what? <laughs> <laughs> there, there are, um, and, and when I, I and I don't mean to use that pejoratively. I mean it's just like you know, some people are clever and some people are not, and there is nothing wrong with that. You, you, clever is not a um, a moral good. Right. Yeah. And it's largely not in your control. I mean, like you can develop your mind and all that. I don't mean that. I mean. You know, it, but your your genetic inheritance and the you know it's like pulling the lever you know on a slot machine whatever came up came up you know you didn't do it so um, anyway uh, what I'm trying to basically say is that all of the races there is not there if you have this if you have this idea that some groups are smarter than others it's now's the time to get that out of your head it's not true and it's not and it's hurtful. All right, so the Jewish response. Some sought to escape their Judaism completely and blend into the larger American society. And, and you know, the, um, we've known secular Jews to do that um, or to change their name. I mean, part of the reason why I mentioned at the start of this class that my son, he has the last name of Field because his family, his father's family named themselves after Marshall Field, which, um, who was the most successful um, Jew they knew. But it's also not a coincidence they picked a name that is actually um, Irish in order, origin. Um, and, uh, although Irish is again, could be Catholic. Um, so it could be Irish got discriminated against horribly in this country. But um, they were trying to pick a name that would be, um, give them greater cachet, you know, and be able to be um, accepted and not um, discriminated against in places like the military. Um, job choice. Others adopted strategies designed to minimize or mask the Jewish identity in public. So, um, you know, you, you really hear it, people, there are different times and places when people won't wear a kippah, you know, the head covering, or um, a Star of David, for example, or any kind of these markers that identify you as Jewish in public. Um, it, that's a sort of a litmus test of how people feel about being public, about being Jewish. Um, uh, one of the other things that would happen, and I'd already mentioned this, changing one's name, you know, like that, that is a fairly common thing. And especially in this, er in this particular era, that's when you see people change their name in order to be accepted. So Betty Persky becomes Lauren Bacall, who's her star on the, uh, you know, um, it's looking like it's kind of uh, got a lot of wear on it. And then if Israel Berlin uh, became Ir Irving Berlin. Yeah, example. And that continues, you know, like uh, there's some more, there's some more of those. Um, there's quite a few of them actually. Um, Jews aren't the only ones who change their names, you know, for the record, um, to become more, they, we, we called it Americanized, but it's really more, you know, whiter <laughs> is a, probably a better way of putting it, you know, to sound more like the, what the majority perceived themselves to be. Um, and as a way to not have the Jewishness be the first thing noticed about them. And so you also see people doing things like nose chops or um, you know, trying to change how uh, they look, how they sound, how they present themselves in order to seem less foreign, less uh, other. And not foreign in the sense of not American born, but less like somebody who doesn't belong here. And um, so Americanization has been a bit of a mixed play that way. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Questions on that? My mother changed her name from Sarah to Shirley to, to be more American. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and actually Irving is one of the names, you know, so Israel's, all the Israel's become Irving and um, the Esther's become Estelle and Estelle especially because it sounds like Esther and also they both have star in there, you know, they're both star names um, and, um, you know, and, and so forth, you know, like uh, um, Ben's great grandfather's name was Valdel uh, Finkelstein um, and he changes it to William Field, although it goes by Val all his life. So, um, uh, you have, you know, that, that's a fairly common thing. So Americanization. So this is some of what I was starting to talk about at the, very start, at the opening of this particular lecture is as the 20th century progressed, more and more Eastern European Jews found home in the reform movement. By 1931, half of reform synagogues membership traced its roots to Eastern Europe. So it used to be exclusively a German Jewish project. And then, uh, but by 1931, we're, we're um, a mix of the two. In 1937 is when the reform rabbis adopt a platform that supported Zionism. And that's probably um, a, a direct result of that immigration of the Eastern Europeans and their migration to the reform movement. Because um, the East, I had said before, Western Europe, uh, if you became enlightened, a masculine, you tended to go towards um, reform of the religion. And if you were Eastern European and became masculine, you, you tended towards Zionism. And so when you have both groups in a congregation, you end up with reform of the uh, service and Zionism. So hence, reform of Judaism has both. Um, that platform from 1937 also supported the reintroduction of more traditional Jewish rituals and ceremonies because the Eastern Europeans brought that with them. Um, the uh, German Jewish reform was a lot more um, we're a lot more traditional than our forebears in this regard. So you have congregations in those days that wouldn't wear a kippah, a head covering, wouldn't wear a tali, wouldn't shake a little of an antwarm in, in um, Sukkot, wouldn't, you know, there's a whole series of things that, that have confirmation instead of a bar bar mitzvah. They would, you know, um, uh, mostly English in the prayer service. Um, uh, to give you an idea, uh, here's, a, here's a good example. Um, in the, at the end of the service, we end all the service every time with a, a song named Lenu, right? Lenu le shabach adon hakol adekudula leotzebreshit. Okay, it's in Hebrew, right? Um, the standard version of that in the reform movement back in the day, the time period we're talking about is, let us adore the ever living God and render praise. That's the song they would end with. It's the same, it, it, it's in the version of the Elenio, but you'll notice it's in English. You also notice yeah. it's a big grand song, right? Um, you know, this doesn't sound like you need like a choir and rope to sing that. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. even that call and answer version of it. You know, let us adore, let us adore. <laughs> the ever living God, the ever living God, and render parade. I mean, it's a big deal. Um, and and <laughs> if you sing that to anybody who comes from classical reform, they're like, oh my God. <laughs> they, they, they so know that song. <laughs> they're very familiar with it. Because um, it was a thing. Um, so it, reform has, changed, it, it's become a lot more traditional over time. Um, and that, that actually, in, as an aside, is probably related to the fact that um, we've been sending all of our students to Israel. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember precisely what year that started. I think 69, uh, late 60s, early 70s, we started sending all the students to Israel that are for rabbinical school for the first year. Okay. However, the fastest growing movement during this period was conservative Judaism, which sought to balance tradition and change. Conservative Judaism is the one that's now having a lot of trouble. It's actually the one that's hit, they've been hit hardest by demographic trends, trends um, because the folks who were choosing conservative Judaism then um, and what the, the, the demographics that favored it then have shifted and now don't favor it. So uh, it's been, it was in a period of great expansion at that time and in great um, um, contraction at the moment. So we'll see what happens with them. Okay, Mordecai Kaplan, um, he lived 1881 to 1983. I mean, just astonishingly long. 
and he taught almost that entire time at um, Jewish uh, Theological Seminary, which is uh, GTS, which is in New York, the conservative flagship. <clears throat> when he, he was born in Lithuania, when he was eight years old is when he moves to New York City, never leaves. He receives ordination from conservative movements, Jewish Theological Seminary also never leaves. Um, Zionism was central to his vision of Judaism. He also was of the idea that halakha, which is Jewish law, should have a vote, but not a veto. Um, pithy, he was, he was pithy. Um, profoundly influential thinker, profoundly. Mm. Questions? Yeah, what, do, what does that mean? Halakha should have a vote, but not a veto. Um, he's willing to change things. Um, you know, he's, he, so he, he's actually ends up being the founder of Reconstructionist Judaism, even though he himself never leaves conservative Judaism, he ends up sparking a new movement. Um, um, and the Reconstructionist, his ideas are that um, God, that uh, God doesn't do any, um, does not enact any miracles. He's not into any sort of supernatural belief. Um, he thinks that our practice and our understanding of God should keep up with the time since so it should be modernized. He's um, orthoprax in the sense that he observes the most of the commandments and, and such the way that they are as written, so to speak, but he's also totally fine with changing things if needed. So he wrote a um, Haggadah that got him um, uh, excommunicated by the Orthodox rabbis. You know, wow. Yeah, um, and um, he's a he's a profoundly or uh, original, and he's a profoundly original and um, influential thinker. But it's hard to see that he, how influential he was, because we now take a lot of his ideas for granted. He's also the origin of the shul with the pool, which becomes the JCC. The idea of having uh, Jewish cultural centers, social centers, that Judaism should have more than just um, a, um, that our connection should be more than just a religious connection. Mm. So, so he would approve of my ice cream social. <laughs> totally would approve. I'm being totally capitalist when I'm doing that. <laughs> Are the J JCC still in operation? Oh yeah, we have one. We're, and we're actually... Uh, our our uh, uh, our preschool, the Early Childhood Center, is, mm -hmm. a, is part of the JCC. Oh, they, okay. Um, so yeah, no, there, there is definitely a JCC, um, and it's sort of an answer to the YMCA, but it, it, a little different because it'll also do things like um, cultural film festivals of Israeli filmmaking. Hmm. So, for an example, it's not it's not just a YMCA. Okay, questions? Okay, the Great Depression. Um, with the failure of the Bank of New York, or New York Bank of the United States, excuse me, um, many Jews saw their life savings all but disappear. Jewish garment workers who made up one third of the New York Jewish population was devastated when they lost their jobs because of course, garment industry was greatly hard hit by this. People don't buy clothing um, when they're out of um, for young Jews entering the labor market, the discriminatory, discriminatory hiring practices um, made already scarce jobs almost non-existent. So um, then it was really not okay to be Jewish. You, you, were, you were not gonna be hired. Many, many Jews supported President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal policies, uh, which created programs to give relief, create jobs and stimulate the economic recovery. He also didn't have quotas for Jews. And so it was possible to get this government, these government jobs. So um, and my understanding is this is the origin, but I've heard elsewhere that this is the origin of um, Jewish Americans primarily voting Democrat. This is the start of that. Um, and there is a, a percentage that vote Republican usually the more orthodox um, uh, uh, that's been growing over the, over the years, but um, we're still, um, I wanna say 70, 75% um, Democrat um, still. 
makes you wonder that in this con the conservative movement uh, from the previous president, if you call it a conservative movement, that you wouldn't have Jews leaving the party, you know? Well, you um, so um, uh, there were Jews, who, there are Jews who support Trump and, and, uh, and the Trumpist move in the Republican party. Um, mm -hmm. And it's usually, you know, those that I know anyway, um, over the question of Israel, they feel like you know, that what happens is if you talk to them, they say that the Democratic Party um, is too beholden to its left flank that um, ha has that, um, neg that negative view of Israel as a settler country and as opposed to a uh, uh, indigenous movement. And mm. that um, the Republicans understand the true value of <coughs> I'm sorry, I just breathe it in again. Ah. I understand the true value of uh, Israel as an ally and its true uh, history and relationship to the United States, and that uh, moving the um, embassy to Jerusalem means that they fundamentally get it, and so then therefore then they they support. Um, not just the Republican Party, but in, in particular, the Trumpist side of the Republican Party. Um, uh, as I said, it's still um, running, a, so far as I last saw, and, uh, and correct me if you see something, you know, if you see an article, let me know. Um, last I saw, it's running about uh, three quarters, um, don't agree with that argument, to, and one quarter does. Okay. So, um, uh, and um, yeah, and we do. I've heard both groups in this. This uh, I, I've heard in this congregation. We actually have a full spectrum. I've seen there are there are Trump uh, Jews in our congregation, uh, so it's not exclusively an Orthodox phenomenon. Although they tend the ones who support Trump, as I said, usually not always tend to be towards the uh, Orthodox side of things. Mm -hmm. um, but they definitely tend to be politically conservative. Okay. So, and and it's interesting because yeah, you know, as I said, I also have people who are like really far left on on the whole is, uh, Israel question. Um, quite a few, and and the two groups do not see eye to eye at all. It's one of the reasons why I don't uh, preach Israel from the pulpit. Um, yeah. And why, you know, I, I'm happy to talk about history of Israel. Our next section is in fact the history of Israel. Um, and I'm also more than willing to bring things like um, Israel and movie, um, movies from Israel because that helps you see it from the Israeli's point of view. Um, and frankly, both sides have think points that are correct and both sides have uh, uh, points that are actually incorrect. You know, like, like that's not quite fair, that's not quite right. So if you right. ever want me to critique either side, let me know or, <laughs> or vice versa, point out the value of it. I'm happy to do so. Okay. Um, okay, so where are we? There, chapter 20. So any questions? Oh, I'm right at five. I didn't, I spent all my time on chapter 19. Um, I'll just give you a couple quick things and then I'll probably pick it up in the next one. Um, so the British mandate, and uh, um, on December 9th, 1917, the British army having defeated the Ottoman Turks now controlled Jerusalem. So this is the moment where the British take over um, a part of the Middle East along with the French. Um, and crowds of residents, both Jews and Arabs, flood the streets to greet the British as liberators. So there's a reason for this. You, you know, keep that point in mind. Um, a month earlier, Britain's Balfour Declaration had promised support for Jewish homeland in Palestine. Here's the problem. Um, that's not the only group they promised. Yeah. Yeah. So timeline, 1917. So we're covering the same ground. Uh, British army takes control of Jerusalem. 1919, the third Aliyah begins, eventually bringing 40,000 Jews to Palestine. <clears throat> 1920, the Jews form the Haganah to protect the Zionist community in Palestine. In 1924, the fourth Aliyah begins, eventually bringing 80,000 Jews to Palestine. In 1929, the Arab riots occur throughout Palestine. Um, so you, you can see the pushback. And Palestinian Arab, um, Arabs, I forgot the year there, began the great uprising. Let me tell you what that year was. 
just have the book in front of me here. Uh, that's 1936 is the Great Uprising. And then in 1939, the British issued the white paper ending their commitment to the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. They're not off the hook though. You know, they, obviously it ended up happening anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so this is what's going on in, um, in the mandate era um, of Palestine. It's, this is what it's called, it's the mandate era or mandatory Palestine, it's the other names. And I'll just do the roots of the conflict um, and then I'll pick up from there next time because we're right at 459. So this will even hold in your head um, in the meantime, you know, hold on and then think about. Like the Jews, the Arabs were filled with hope for the British had promised them that they would receive an independent state in return for staging a revolt against the Turks. So, you know, the British had specific um, policy object objectives in the Middle East and um, were happy to promise multiple groups conflicting promises to try to get that. However, when um, they'd also had signed a secret agreement with France in which each uh, side pledged to um, uh, win the war with the Turks, they hoped that their promises would gain the cooperation of the various groups. Um, oh, wait a minute, did I just read a different line? I did. In which each side pledged, pledged to take a piece of the Ottoman Empire for itself and jointly rule most of Palestine. What that meant is they made conflicting uh, promises so that when they won, then they couldn't actually deliver on everything they had promised. They couldn't split uh, the area with the French and provide an independent state for the Arabs and provide an independent state for the Jews and you know, do that in such a way that everybody was happy. That wasn't gonna happen. So um, what ends up happening is Britain and France carve up the region much the way they planned. And um, neither the, and they're not too popular with the Arabs or the Jews. Um, but, and so this isn't the only reason for the conflict. You know, the British, if the British hadn't been involved, you probably, would, it's highly likely you would have still seen conflict. Um, but it certainly didn't help <laughs> and um, made it much worse than it needed to be at the beginning anyway. Questions? Yes. Um, the Balfour Declaration was issued in 1917. Mm -hmm. So between 1917 and 1939, mm -hmm. what, what did Britain do to assist the Jews to establish a homeland, if anything? Just uh, issue that paper, the Balfour Declaration. Um, and one of the things that happens actually is there's this ongoing tension because um, what happens with Jews at this moment is you see in the, you know, here, you have 40,000 Jews in, in, with the third Aliyah and 80,000 Jews with the fourth Aliyah. Um, Britain doesn't actually want that many Jews to be showing up and puts limits on immigration and sometimes tries to turn ships back and you have illegal immigration happening um, and you also have illegal, uh, 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 not, I was gonna say the wrong word, uh, have illegal gun smuggling into Palestine for um, creating these units for self-defense like Haganah. And you have um, a great amount of tension between the, um, the pioneers, what they get called, um, and the mandatory, the, the um, British um, mandatory presence. Um, and yeah, it's a source of, um, of a lot of tension, actually. And um, to this day, the Israelis are not too, too thrilled with the British and the British press doesn't tend to be particularly um, uh, favorable towards as well. There's some, there's some bad blood there. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. What what part were the French interested in? Uh, <clears throat> same thing as the uh, British in that they wanted to control territory. Um, a lot, you know, this is the age of empires, and before um, that whole imperialism sort of falls apart. 
And so they're looking for mostly raw materials, uh, you know, in terms of when, when you have European powers controlling parts of the, of the rest of the world, they're usually there for the purpose of getting raw material. So. And were there, I mean, were the French, the French army going in and like mm -hmm. trying to harvest raw materials or did they just go into like trade and buy things? Uh, <clears throat> they, um, they're there for um, enforcing the rule, you know. Um, uh, you know, the, they're there in support of uh, the, their colony, and so the French have colonies like across, like North Africa, for example, um, and parts of the Middle East, and um, and in parts of Africa. And so there's a number of uh, like African countries that have French as one of their official languages because of the French. Um, yeah, because I mean, like, so I, I worked throughout Sub Saharan Africa. So, you know, you always okay. find it interesting because after World War One, when Germany lost its territory in Africa, the French and British just divided it. Yeah. Um, so you will find places where, like, German Togoland was just split in half between the French right. and the British. Right. Um, right. <laughs> but, but you still see, like, French is native, a national language or, you know, English right. is a working language in these countries. Um, but I, I've never heard of, like, the French role in Palestine before. Oh, okay, that they split it up. Uh, they yeah. take over like Syria um, uh, mm -hmm. is where they're at. So yeah, no, they, they'd split it up. Most of Palestine is and ends up uh, uh, in the British, Palestine itself ends up in the um, British mandate. Um, and so you still do see a fact, English is one of the official languages of Israel um, and it shows up on all of the um, road signs, which makes it easier for like, uh, American travelers, because <laughs> you don't have to read, because uh, there's a lot of forms and signs and the like have three languages on them, right? Um, Hebrew, Arabic, and English. Now, actually, you also see Amharic, which is uh, Ethiopian, and you, saw, and you also see Russia. So uh, there, I went, well, last time I was there, I took a picture of a sign um, in a bathroom in Tel Aviv, which was in five or six languages, <laughs> none of which <laughs> used the same alphabet. Think about it. Uh -huh. Not one of them, you, because Amharic is is um, is a wildly different alphabet than you know, like it looks very different than anything you've ever seen if you're not familiar with it. Um, if you're only familiar with like uh, European or Middle Eastern languages and Arabic, you know, and and they go from different directions: English, um, Cyrillic. You know, the the, the um, Russian uses the a different alphabet as well, and so. It was just quite something to see toilet out of order in like five languages, none of which is <laughs> not <in> that. <laughs> That's got, you know, like, think about the administration of that. <laughs> what you have to do <laughs> um, is challenging. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I'm also going to stop the recording. And we will pick up, you know, uh, next week I will start with. Uh, um, chapter 20. I'll probably start at the beginning of chapter 20 just to, you know, loop a little bit and get us going, but I won't spend as much time in the first few slides. So now I'm stopping the recording. <laughs>